Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trading User Group Weekly Roundup. This is for the trading week ending September 17th, 2021. I'm Preston Rent. Thanks for tuning in. Well, has the fat lady sung or are we going to bounce? Well, let's dive in a little bit deeper and kind of see what the market and the charts are showing us. First, let's just take a look at where we've been this past week. So what I want to do, uh, let's just take a look at each of the individual elements here. Let's first look at the index performance. Uh, as you can see in the U.S. markets, everything was in the red with the exception of the Russell. Dow's been in the red, I think, three weeks in a row. Year to date, we're all in double digits, so it's still fairly strong. If you look at the sector performance for this past week, energy was very strong. 3.2% materials came in the worst. 3.19 to the downside. Annual performance year to date, energy. I guess that's not how you spell energy, is it? <laughs> but it's the strongest, 32.86%. Uh, Staples, the worst, a little over 7%, but still solidly in the green, just like we were. Now, the Russell, the small cap index, was the only one that finished in the green this week. But as you can see, the one that got hurt the most was the S&P. P.E. ratio, the Ford P.E. is at 21.95. Um, still rather... Uh, stretched in my opinion the 10-year treasury is higher than the um, dividend yield S&P dividend yield by about five basis points but look at the S&P earnings yield right you reverse the earnings per share estimate for the year which right now I've seen highs of 210 and lows is 190 as far as earnings per share estimate but let's call it 201 divided by the closing price roughly of 4406 gives us an S&P earnings yield of a little over four and a half percent so do you think the money is going to continue to go in treasuries at 1.3%? Our money is going to flow into the S&P with an earnings yield of 4.5. That's why money continues to flow heavily into the S&P. Okay? And granted, we do have step backs and setbacks. But basically, money is still being encouraged to go into the equity market. Okay? Um, the, the basis difference the yield in the S&P over the 10-year treasury is a positive 3.19%, right? So that's that drives the market. You can also see, and the calculation here is also wrong, but the VIX closed this week at 20.81. Last week, it closed at 20.95. So even though we closed slightly in the red, with the exception of the S&P down a little bit more, uh, the VIX stayed relatively flat. So that tells me whenever the markets start going lower, Always use the volatility gauge to just see is there fear in the markets or is just just a normal um, pullback, okay? And if we kind of just break this out and let's take a look at the economic data. Well, looking at the economic data, we're getting some of the uh, sensitivity and sentiment. I mean, we got a number of things coming up, right? We got worries about the supply chain, elevated valuations, as I said. Also, with the potential of tightening monetary policy, keep in mind, we get the Fed FOMC meeting this coming Wednesday. Uh, we'll get uh, Boom Boom Powell out there talking about that. And we got something that could impact the markets, potential train wreck the end of this month with the Dems and the Republicans coming together to agree or not to agree on an annual U.S. budget deficit increase. Uh, last time we had shut the government down for a period of time, the markets fell a little over 4%. So I don't think I hear anybody talking about that right now. But from what I hear in the po political front, I don't see any Republican willing to step forward. So um, it's going to be a battle royale in an, uh, another couple of weeks. So, And that's on back of the stimulus plan that the Democrats are trying to get through. Uh, the tax plan they're trying to get through to pay for the stimulus. So there's a lot of activity out there that could clearly move the markets a lot lower. Okay. Um, now, this past Tuesday, we did get the uh, Labor Department reported CPI increased uh, 10 basis points in August. Now, uh, the markets were expecting a 30 point or a 30 basis point increase, but it did still move up. So we're getting higher inflation. All right. Uh, we did get August retail sales um, jumped 1.8%. So the consumers are still spending, right? We're getting the consumer spending. I mean, that's a good thing. And if we look at the treasuries, um, you can see that, you know, while softer than expected inflation kind of eased 
investor worries about an expedited quantitative tightening process from the feds. We did see solid manufacturing and retail sales data, as I just indicated. So these things are continuing to just slowly drive yields a little bit higher. I don't think yields are going to be as high as people think, but I do believe they're going to grind higher. Now, if we do get a crash, well, let me rephrase that. If we do get a little bit further pullback, and I'll show you the charts in a minute, then we may have the yields come down a little bit, but I would use that as an opportunity to go long interest rates or short bonds, okay? Right now, though, the market's gonna be heavily focused, as I said, this coming Wednesday's FOMC policy statement and our very own Power Ranger, Boom Boom Powell, that would be Jerome Power Ranger, Boom Boom Powell, um, is coming out with this, in, in this press conference. And there's gonna be a lot of questions around quantitative tightening versus interest rate liftoff. And basically the questions are gonna concern when and at what pace. It's kind of where we're gonna go, right? Now, of course, if we come over to Europe, take a look at the European, the theater, you can see just about, well, no, everything was in the red in Europe. The Euro stocks, the FTSE, the CAC 40, DAX, all in the red, solidly in the green year to date, however. Um, solidly in the green year to date. But a crossover in the Eurozone, uh, Eurozone bonds also kind of moved a little bit higher along with U.S. Treasuries this week. Um, the ECB this past week expects to meet their 2% inflation target by 2025. I kind of laugh at these really far out expectations. Keep in mind the U.S. Fed's never gotten a, a forecast right further than six months out ever. They're always off sometimes substantially. So when I see these forecasts, it's just for press, it's for print, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Sometimes the market price action reacts to it, okay? Um, inflation in the UK, meanwhile, <laughs> moved up 3.2% in August. It's the highest level we've seen in nine years in the UK. So we're getting a lot of that pressure there. I think inflation is going to be a lot you know, and it's just, it's a gray area. You're not going to see transitory versus sticky inflation. Some of it's going to be transitory, like some of the supply chain issues. Some of it's going to be sticky, right? I mean, I'm, I'm seeing reports. There's about 65 vessels as of this past Friday, just waiting to offload off the coast of California, one of the largest ports. The average wait day on a per vessel basis is about 8.7 days. That's slowing things down. And not only that, but the transit time, is now on average for every vessel coming from China, 71 days. It used to be 40 days. So like an airplane, you know, when you're going from one city to another and a lot of thunderstorms, sometimes what normally is an hour and a half flight turns into two and a half hours because you're delayed on the ground, you're delayed in the air, and then when you land, you're delayed getting your gate. Same thing with logistics and boats. So that does have a tendency to jack up prices. The cost of containers have moved up from $4,800 a container back in 2007 to about um, 4,800 to 20,000 per container now. It is insane. A lot of these costs will not be passed along to consumers, but a lot of them will. So we've got some of this stuff that's going to disappear, but a lot of it's going to stay. Primarily wage hikes, because it's hard to pull away a price increase or a wage hike. You just can't do that. Some of the sticky stuff, uh, you just can't undo. But the transitory stuff, like some of the supply chain stuff, you can. But I think it's going to last longer than people think. Okay. Now, uh, look at the Asian markets. Nikkei, Japan, is the only one that's in the green for the week. And year to date, they're up huge, 11%. That's big for Japan. Okay. They're, they're, they're in campaign season when their president resigned and they've got a new president that's projected to win in the same party. So that's why they can say this. And this guy, I think it's Tara Kono, has already come out and said that he supports more stimulus, continuity and central bank policy, blah, 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 i.e. translation. Very, very dovish. So because when the old president resigned or walked away, turned in his his. Um, I guess his, his job or his role as president of Japan, um, the markets kind of were flummoxed. They didn't know who was going to come in, but now this new guy, it looks like he's going to win the election. And that's going to be positive because the J Japanese markets, like every country, loves a lot of money. So we did see some data out of Japan that their exports rose about 26% year over year compared to last year. Um, so I think Japan should do fairly well. OK, especially with stimulus being supported with this new president. Now, 
By the same token, over in the other part of the Asian Pacific arena, China is having problems. They've got weak August economic data. They got new uh, uh, Corona COVID outbreaks in the, the Fujian province. They got a huge debt crisis at the third largest property developer in all of China that's Evergrande. There's a talk of could this spread and be a contagion effect to other developers and because real estate's really bubblicious in China. Um, they've got a thread of China just came out. Xi has already undone a lot of their technology companies. He crushed them, right? Uh, Baba and Tencent, JD. A lot of those fell more than 50% a couple of months ago. They're still trying to bounce back, but I don't think they'll get back up there. He's come out with tighter gaming regulations in Macau, so it's dampening investor sentiment there. Um, so you throw all of that together, and um, now everybody wants to see, is China going to step up and help Evergrande? Um, because they right now their debt load's greater than U.S. dollars, $300 billion. So they're going to need to restructure, and just will China come in and save them or what? Right? They can't repay their latest bank interest note. So there could be a huge liquidity crisis at the third largest. So these things have a tendency to spread. So we got to watch that really closely. And on the economic front, in addition to all of that, their August indicators were really surprisingly weak. You know, a lot of it with the shutdown with COVID and industrial output, retail sales, fixed asset investment, all of them missing expectations. In fact, <clears throat> retail sales had its lowest or slowest growth since 2020 of August. So China's got their issues. Hang Sen, which is kind of tied at the hip of China, not doing very well either. Uh, even though China is up year to date a little bit on a couple of uh, uh, supportive statements from the government a couple of weeks ago on stimulus, uh, it's just going to be very, very difficult, right? Just very difficult to play. So what I want to do, I'm just kind of giving you that quick backdrop. Let's go take a look at the charts here. Um, and let's just see how things are settling out. First thing I'm going to do is show you the key and primary chart. Now, I've been talking to this with our members and for you guys here on our free roundup for months now. And they're just now starting to pick it up in the press, the biz press, Barron's, Wall Street Journal, others. But we've been talking about it and focused on it. And what is that? That's the 50 EMA or the 50 moving average. Uh, it'll pop up on your screen here. You can see this red line. Notice we closed below the 50 EMA. Now, as we started pulling back, I said, this is going to be the key test. Why is it going to be the key test? Well, I'm going to do it again for you guys, especially you guys that may not have seen this before. I'm just going to shrink it down and I'm going to include the entire year uh, in this, in this um, uh, chart right here. So on the far left-hand side of the chart, is the beginning of the year, okay? And let me just widen it out so you guys can see just a little bit of everything. I'm just trying to space it out for you guys. So if we look at this, and this is for the entire year, over here, the red line, you can see we have not had two closes below the red line this year. In fact, the S&P has gone 218 days since we've had two red candles below the 50 EMA. This is a second longest streak since 1990, right? Now, I started picking up on this back in May, and we've been using this as kind of a, is it a buy the dip moment or the, or the buy the dippers coming in, um, or is it going to roll over more? The last time we broke this string, we fell another 5%. Okay. I will also remind you since March 23rd, 2020, in the year 2020, we've had five pullbacks on average about 7.5% in 2020. This year, we have not had that. Okay, We've not had one 5% pullback. Now, we've touched the 50 EMA. But look at the bar. Every time we either touched intraday or closed below the 50 EMA, the very next bar was a solid green candle. Every single time. Okay, Every time. Every time. Now, right here, we close below the 50 EMA. So as I've been telling our members, it's not where we close on Friday. And sure enough, we were down, you know, um, 56 points in the futures when the markets finally settled in for the weekend. 
56 points. But look, we closed there below the 50 EMA. We closed there below the 50 EMA. We closed there well below the 50 EMA. And we closed there below the 50 EMA. So that is four, five times this year, okay? Five times we've closed below the 50 EMA. And if you look at the very next bar, solid green taking us back over the 50 EMA and the buy the dip crowd came back in. We did have an intraday retest here about a week and a half, two weeks later. But it did not close below the 50 EMA. And again, a green bar the very next day, right? So these are all, and then all the ones that we went intraday below the 50 EMA right there. We touched the 50 EMA there intraday. Uh, we went below the 50 EMA here intraday. We went below the 50 EMA there intraday. Um, and we went below right there intraday. But at no time, two bars in a row. So this is for the entire year of 2021. So the key for us is where are we going to close on Monday? Okay. So now if I see this and now it seems like the rest of Wall Street sees this and the technical patterns, everybody kind of sees this thing. You know, it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Let's blow this up. So now here's the 50 EMA. So what's the pattern going to be that we're going to be watching for? Here's the key, okay, on this pattern. So we closed right here. All right, that was a close. The notice the 50 EMA has now got pretty much a flat vector, okay? So if we were to look at history, on Monday we should close somewhere north of the 50 EMA. Whether where we close doesn't matter. We should close north of the 50 EMA. We could come back and retest the 50 EMA, but we should be north of it to buy the dip crowd. It'll take us back up above that key level, 44.72, and then we'll move up. And it could be a little choppy, but we'll move up. If on Monday we close below the level that we closed on Friday, Okay, now I'm talking about where we close, not where we move during the day. It's important to look at the close, and we close below that. That'll be the first time this year. If that happens, you can pretty well bet the algos are going to fire off and assume we're going to go down further. How much further? The average uh, has been 5%. We saw that in September of last year, over a year ago, and we saw it in October on a retest, more than 5%. So what does that mean? And that's plus 5% from that point right there, okay? So if we look at this, and I were to just kind of put a, a marker on it, right, just to kind of show you, we closed down roughly from the highs a little over 3.1%, okay? So if I move up to the 50 EMA at 2.8%, roughly, and we go another 5% down on, and I'm just pulling averages out, right? That puts us at 7.82%. So where does 7.82% fit should we get two bars in a row that um, the second bar not being a green bar, but being a red bar, and we go even lower? Where would the 7.2% roughly take us, all right? So let's just kind of Go in here and just give us a little bit of a marker, right? So right here at the at the 50 EMA, it's roughly about 2.82. So let's call it 7.8. Let's call it 8% round numbers. So if we come down here at about 8% round numbers, it puts us down around the 4184. So call it 4200 to 4175 range. Now notice the 50 or the 200 EMA, which is a longer term support point. It's got an upward vector to it, so it'll be up just a little bit, but that puts us right around 10%. So a correction territory, which as you guys should know, is 10% or more. If we fall below the, if we fall to the 200 EMA, that would give us about an official correction from the highs up here, okay? A little bit of an official correction. Um, and if we fall the average that we've seen since the move higher off the COVID lows, that'll put us around the 4,200, 4,175 area, okay? 
So that's what we're going to be looking for. It is simple as that. Now, understand on Wednesday, we got the Fed coming out. They have so far been dovish in every session. If they're dovish again, and Boom Boom Powell is going to do his best to stay dovish, then that could give us and the buy the dip crowd reason to come back up. Also, understand September and October tend to be the most volatile months of the trading year and also tend to be where we average down one and a half to two percent right uh in the markets so that just kind of shows where we are we haven't had this will be we have not had a five percent pullback all year normally you have a couple of those every year if i show you what would be a five percent pullback that takes us down right down to about the 4320 area somewhere right here somewhere around that key price pivot point right 4350 area right not quite five percent um but a five percent move would get us around 4320 right um so i i would not be surprised to see us quickly move down here next week if the fed say something that nobody likes but the other looming political train wreck which I think can be greater than the Fed, because so far the Fed has been supportive of the market and tends to move it higher. I think the biggest fear I would have is that the Republicans and Democrats don't come together on raising the budget deficits or the budget uh, ceiling. They got to raise it by a trillion. A lot of Republicans are saying, we ain't going to do it. We're not going to help the Democrats, right? So they do that, that could move the markets another 4% down, okay? So that gives us that, five percent move from the current price here but remember that's not going to happen until the end of september the fiscal new year in the u.s government starts october 1st but they got till october 15th to officially run it so that means that we will probably run uh, uh deficit uh will run into the october 15th then you'll see headline news and everything about how we're going to be killing people because the Republicans won't, you know, the Democrats will play it up pretty big. Uh, the Republicans will play it up big on their side. There'll be a lot of battles going on. So net net, it can just add more volatility to the markets. This is what I'm seeing guys. Now, if we look at the Dow Jones transports, okay, this is not a pretty chart guys. This is the daily chart of the Dow Jones transports. We've been going down since May. OK, you can see the regression channel uh, down since May but with this attempt here. But notice the 50 EMA. We can't hold it. The 50 EMA is clearly pointing at a downward vector. We're coming down to my near term target here of around 4250. Now, we cannot have a bullish market with the transports going down. Now, part of this is probably due to the logistics issues in C, but the Dow Jones transports includes ocean freight, air, ground, rail. It includes everything, okay? So it basically under the assumption that if goods aren't being shipped, then the economy is going to suffer because consumers are going to draw back on their spending. So far, the consumers have not. But if inflation gets tighter and people get a little bit worried, you're going to see them, you know, zip up the pockets to their, their wallet and they're going to put money on the sidelines and then you're going to see this happen. Now, the other thing that can start to suffer is because of the rising cost of shipping goods, you're going to see a lot of companies start talking about uh, uh, decreasing profit margins because these costs have to be borne by someone. Companies right now are not passing very many of these price increases along the consumers, but pretty soon you're going to see that happening. OK, uh, consumers are already feeling it now across a number of different things, especially rising energy prices. But there's the Dow Jones transports. Now, if we look at the Russell, right, the Russell is the only one that that was kind of sideways for the week to the slightly higher. Right. But the Russell is still below the 50 EMA, still in this choppy zone. If we look at the Dow, right, look at the Dow futures right here down 255 points on Friday. Look at the Dow futures. It reflects more the transports. We're well below the 50 EMA here, okay? Um, and we took out prior lows. We haven't been this all the way back to intraday of July 21st, back in the summer. So 
I'm expecting some more downside near term. We'll see if the buy the dip crowd comes in, but I'm expecting a little bit more downside. If we look NASDAQ, which has been holding up fairly strong, right? It fell 226 points this past week, right? Still north of the 50 EMA though. NASDAQ's really the only one um, that's above the 50 EMA right now. Now this is the NASDAQ 100, but keep in mind the FANG stocks, which are fairly strong, account for over 40% of the valuation of NASDAQ 100 futures, okay? If we look at the composite NASDAQ, which is everybody in the technology space, it's still fairly strong, okay? Uh, and then if we look at just the FANG index, this is a customized index that comprises Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, and Amazon. We're still very strong here too. So money is still flowing uh, nicely into the big FANG stocks, okay? They've got great balance sheets, a lot of cash. Uh, Microsoft just announced they're coming back and buying back a lot of stock. Apple's buying a lot of stock. Apple just had their big annualized day where they're coming out with new phones and things like that. Google's doing very strong. Uh, YouTube revenue in Google is almost caught up to all of Netflix revenue. That shows you how big YouTube is. So all of these, uh, the only danger I see in these, but it's more longer term than near term, is just break up by the government, right? That's the only thing I see is this kind of keeping these uh, a lid on them somewhat, but not too much, okay? If we look at emerging markets, um, you can see here just how ugly it is. It's, it's you know, we're down uh, a pretty good little bit in emerging markets. You can see the all-time high, well, the all-time highs this year for emerging markets. So you'll see if I were to highlight it, we're in official correction territory. We're down about 11.85% in emerging markets, all right? So we're in official correction territory there. And keep in mind, Dow, about 65, 68% of the total profits in the Dow come from offshore. So that's why the Dow is suffering probably more so than NASDAQ, the S&P, um, or the Russell. Or the Russell is, and one thing about the Russell that you guys may not be aware of, we've already hit official correction territory in the Russell. And that only happened just um, back in July. We were officially in correction territory at the bottom of this uh, area several times. So the are what I call this safety zone here where buyers tend to step in at the bottom, sellers tend to step in at the top, but we have not busted out yet, okay? If we come down here and we look at volatility, well, the VIX obviously uh, moved up this week, right? We're in the red zone here, which I classify as down fast markets as opposed to choppy markets. You know, and Friday was clearly that. But keep in mind, this move lower, guys, and I've told our members, it's an orderly market, meaning we've moved lower, but in an orderly fashion. We haven't had these huge spikes, okay? And then it spikes up and then spikes down again. So volatility, while higher, isn't really that bad compared to past spikes, as you can see, where we've been up over 30 or sometimes over 40. You can see these spikes, but they don't last very long. If we do get that pullback like we got, you'll see here in September, we got up over 37. And then the second, the retest of that uh, spike took us to 40 in the VIX. Folks, we're only at 20 now. So if we get that 10% pullback, we're going to get a spike up over 30 for sure and volatility. It's going to happen very quickly because vol doesn't just grind higher. It moves very quickly. So if we look at the front month term structure of volatility, right, you can see we're still in the green. The term structure defines just how much fear is in the market. Right now, we've got a normal contango uh, term structure in the front month vol skew. If we look at the back month vol skew that, that goes out to November, so this is October, November, we're well in the green. So this tells me that the markets, at least thus far, believe the pullback is merely just that, a pullback waiting for the buy the dip crowd to come in and then everybody's gonna lock and load through the end of the year, all right? That's what it's saying so far. Keep in mind, we got a lot of potential things, landmines that we've gotta get through over the next three or four weeks with the FOMC, with the budget 
uh, crisis that I'm sure the Dems and the Republicans here are going to fight over. We got the tax bill, uh, and then we're going to be kicking off earnings the second week in October. So only about another three weeks away. A lot of things could upset the apple cart. But right now, the markets are still comfortable, and it's an orderly move lower. In fact, I think the markets like this pullback. Okay, The 10-year interest rate moved up just a little bit, all right, back over. Now, I've been uh, saying to our members, we want to be long interest rates um, and we want to be short bonds. Here's the bonds, right? You can see, uh, even with that down move, the bonds also went down. It cannot hold us. I've been up here, I've been saying, it's, you want to be short bonds, not long bonds. There will be days like this, like this song, where the equity markets are down and bonds are down. Bonds are inversely correlated to equities. When equities go down hard, bonds go up because it seeks safety in the bond market. There's going to be periods of time when bonds are down hard and equities are down hard, okay? And that's going to move interest rates higher, which makes the equity market even more uh, uh, volatile to the downside, okay? Because there'll be no place for money to hide. You go in equities, you lose money, it's going down. You go in the bond market, you're losing money because the bonds are going down. So what happens is you see a lot of money going to the sidelines into cash instead of in the bonds. And that's kind of what's causing some of this right now, waiting for that shoe to drop and the buy the dip crowd comes back in. Okay. Same thing with the U.S. dollar. In times of stress, people tend to go into the dollar. Look at this. We've had stress. The dollar has been moving higher. But I'm still believing in the dollar is going to go longer, longer term, uh, and you want to be long the euro. Now, if you look at the euro, it's going long, uh, short right here or going down because, remember, it's the dollar index. So the dollar moves opposite. The euro is about almost 58% of the value of the dollar index. Okay. So wherever the euro goes, the dollar tends to go in the opposite direction. But longer term, I think the euro is going to go higher. Okay. Um, if we come over here and we look at gold, I think gold right now is kind of a dead trade. You can see it broke down. It's broken down before. So this just tells me that gold wants to go lower and settle in down here. Typically, this pattern, guys, which is a symmetrical triangle, typically breaks to the upside. But there's just no believers in gold right now. Okay. Um, and I think Bitcoin has kind of stole some of the luster of gold. And you're seeing it come down, but longer term, I'm still a believer that gold will get back up over a couple of thousand. I'm not one of these gold bugs that think it's going to be over four or five thousand. I mean, if we get there, a lot of other crap is going wrong. But I do believe gold will be over two thousand, but just not right now, you know. And speaking of Bitcoin, if we look at Bitcoin and just kind of see where it's going, it was a little bit down today or, or on Friday. You can see this move here with Bitcoin. I think it's going to chop around here. I think near higher rather than lower, but it's going to have a hard uh, uh, move to get back up over 52,000 roughly. It's kind of where it hit its Waterloo and started coming back down again. For members, we got a nice way to play Bitcoin, which is really good for us. So um, we'll kind of review that this, this Sunday in our weekly market watch. And if you're not in, I highly encourage you guys to come in because we're doing uh, well with some of the strategies that we're doing. Now, getting back to the metals market, not precious metals, but industrial, look at copper. Copper is giving it up a little bit more. It attempted to regain that upslope and trend line, which has been on going all the way back to the COVID crash. And then we just rode that all the way up. That was one of the uh, assets that I had put our members into or suggested they go this way. And it's just been very strong. But now you'll notice it's gotten very choppy up here. And I think there's going to be some profit taking. And I can see it even going down a little bit lower for a bit before things settle in and we start another upward uh, uh, move. Keep in mind that it that an EV automobile, electric vehicle, takes 40% more copper than a gasoline um, automobile powered automobile. And there's just, you can't just open a copper mine that quick. So over time, copper is going to drift and go higher. But, you know, week to week, month to month, there's going to be chop and profit taking. But longer term, it's a good long term play, which is what I like here and the way we're kind of playing this thing. Okay. And of course, if we look at energy and oil, um, 
it did move down just a little bit on Friday, oil futures. But I do believe that it's going to kind of chop around here. We hit this peak over here at 76.98 WTI futures. And I said, fade the move. There was the move lower. We've moved out of it. So this tells me there's a change in pattern. Okay. And that means we're going to be kind of running sideways chops slightly up. And, you know, I had suggested here condors or put condors while it was going lower, taking profits and then maybe switching to just all called condors or iron condors for that matter, but be a little bit uh, skewed uh, to the upside right now in the oil markets. All right, everybody. Oh, one other thing I wanted to show you here, Nat gas, um, man, oh man, oh man, Nat gas. Once it got up here, remember what I told you guys, just do a tight spread. Uh, I was pointing our members in this direction. If we do get a move higher in Nat gas, uh, I'm going to sell, sell that one because I think Nat gas is going to wind up back down here. It shouldn't be up this high, right? Uh, there's a lot of reasons why it's up this high. One primary one is a short term reason. You got the uh, tropical storm and the Hurricane Ida and tropical storm hitting the uh, uh, northeast coast or southeast coast of Texas, uh, Louisiana, all the oil fields, derricks, everything down there have been, you know, shut down for a few weeks. So that does cause a temporary stoppage. Uh, but I do believe they'll be able to sort that out. That gas will remain high, just not this high. All right, everybody, that's kind of the weekly roundup here real quick. Members, I will see you this Sunday evening for our weekly market watch. If you're not a member, highly encourage you to come in and join us. We're having a lot of fun. Okay. Take care, everybody. Enjoy the weekend. Ciao now.